Hello everyone. Today we are with a very special guest. He is Mr. Scott Henson. So hello and welcome Scott to this podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So I would like to dive deep into multiple topics. Uh you are a career transitioning coach and you have a great following on LinkedIn and your profile is very impressive. So let's begin by asking you Tell us a bit about your story. Uh, how did you start uh, your role as a career transitioning uh, coach, and a bit more okay. before that as well? Okay, so I started my uh, career transitions coaching um, as as a as I was hired at a university to be a career coach. Um, but before that, I was a teacher. I was an English as a second language teacher. But during my English second language teaching time, I taught in Japan, I taught in China, I taught in the U.S. I lost my job due to budget cuts twice. And that was really hard uh, because the first time I was newly married and in a different country. So that was kind of scary. It meant that I had to get a, a working visa very quickly or I had to leave the country. And then my wife didn't have a U.S. visa. So it was really complicated. So I had to get a job quickly. And then uh, the second time I lost my job, I had a, a new house and a new baby. And so it's like every time I had this new like uh, change in life, I'd also experienced this job cut. So I decided to, to move on. But during that, I learned a lot about um, career transitions. <laughs> and so I became a career coach. Uh, I did that for four years at a university, became a director of that program. And then uh, I changed jobs again. But I when I left that role and it was only last year in about February, March, when I jumped onto LinkedIn and so I was helping a student who was an old student of mine get a job and she was a, an administrative assistant here locally where I live. So it was in person. It wasn't online. And she was an administrative assistant. I worked with her for about three weeks, four weeks. And she landed her dream job as a director and more than doubled her income. And she really encouraged me to keep doing the work. And so I got back into career coaching. So then I jumped on LinkedIn to help another client that was local. And as I was reading through everybody's post, I thought, this is where the need is. And so I decided to kind of start poking at LinkedIn and seeing if I could do career coaching, resume writing, everything on LinkedIn. And then from there, I started to post every day last year in March. So I'm almost to my one year anniversary of posting daily. And I've gone from 500 connections to 15,000. So it's been pretty exciting on the uh, career transitions coaching front. Well, that, that sounds like a great story and a very impressive one indeed. So can you explain me a bit more about what career transitioning coach is all about? So what do you do? What does your day look like? Yeah, so primarily uh, I post every time I look at career transitions. Uh, a lot of people want to move careers. So it, the, the clientele depends. So for example, in the U.S., there are a lot of teachers who would like to move out of teaching and into a different role, maybe a training specialist at a company or a project manager or a customer success manager. So I work with those teachers. I have an education background, so it's easy for me to connect with them and understand their needs. But also anyone that is transitioning careers. I've worked with lawyers and doctors and anyone that's transitioning careers because it is difficult because you often um, feel imposter syndrome. You don't feel like you can. But so there's a lot of work on mindset and identity that take place first. And once you get that figured out, then it's strategies because the modern um, job search is much different than what they experienced 10 years ago when they started their career. So I update them on what to do there. And of course, I update resumes and strategies. Um, so it is a lot of mindset coaching, is a lot of strategies coaching. But more than that, it's what do you want your next chapter of your life to be? Just because you had one dream when you were 
20 years old does not mean that has to be your dream life when you're 30 years old. It's okay to change your dreams and your dreams. And for some people, they need permission to do that and they need to know how to do that. But I want them to look for what does their dream life look like? What does their day look like? How do they want to live? Do they want to take homework or they want to be able to leave it at the office? Do they want to work hybrid or remote or in person? So a lot of it is about what is next and can I create the life I want? want to live now and is it okay for me to leave what I thought I was going to do for life and it turns out I'm not going to do it for life I want to do something else now and he's wanted to help me do that so let's dive deep further into this topic so let's assume that there is a student uh, who has recently uh, let's say passed his uh, third year or uh, is into the last semester of his studies and mm -hmm. wants to now transition from uh, education field, like the studying that he's doing into something like entrepreneurship. So mm. uh, yeah, what is your advice on this and what should be a systematic approach to this? So this is, this is my approach. It might not be the right for everyone, but no matter what your degree is, unless you need a specific license, like to practice medicine, no matter what your degree is, you can do anything you want to out in the world if you get enough people to see you and you're good at it okay so what that means to me is you first of all want to focus on iteration you want to iterate the first content you put out into the world is not going to be great you need six months to a year to get it to kind of where you want it to be so you need to iterate so what i mean is and i and i made this mistake too last year when i thought about starting a, a business i thought about okay, I'm going to get my website perfect. I'm going to get all my curriculum perfect. And then I'm going to start putting it out there and someone's going to buy it. No one knew who I was. So who's going to buy it? So it's better to, to take the approach, in my opinion, to, to build in public. And so now with social media, you can iterate in public. So that's what I did. Post every day until you get really, really good at it, until you find the needs of people. They'll comment on your post and tell you what's right and what's wrong and what you need to like focus on for them and then you iterate on that and you repurpose that material so just iterate and then as you go you build so for example for me i have um my um co-coach named michael stanette we do a monthly synchronous group coaching session and we iterate on that we we create we are creating an asynchronous course at the same time as doing that group coaching so nothing's ever just like i'm going to get it all, all perfect and then i'm going to I'm going to send it to everybody. You work on it as you go in public. It's scary, but if you iterate slowly, you have a small audience, then you have a big audience. And then you get to the point where I'm at now. And so you have 15,000 followers. Now you have distribution. And so now you can put content out there and maybe plug your coaching service, plug whatever you want to create um, or whatever you want to freelance or whatever you want to coach on. Um, once you have that distribution of posting, being a brand, being yourself, but also being working on becoming an expert in your field, you're going to be able to sell to those that just are, are a year behind you, two years behind you, especially 10 years behind you. But you're going to be able to help them because you've gone through it, all the details, and you know what the paths are like that they need to take to get to where you are or to understand what you are offering them as a service every step iterate build as you go and then distribute but in order to do any of this i think you got to flip what most people do don't build it all at first you iterate by online posting whether it's linkedin twitter whatever social media you use that is how to get eyes on you and then people want to buy from a person and they'll buy your product because they know of you you are top of mind when they think of product or service got it you have touched upon various topics that i wanted to talk upon <laughs> so let's mm -hmm. again deep deep uh, dive deep further into this so mm -hmm. the first point uh, that you mentioned uh, like one of the points that you mentioned is about building a personal brand so how important is it and how can a student build a personal brand or a young professional because uh, they don't um, have wealth of experience, so to say, yeah. like they're relatively new. How do they do that? Right. So you can build a personal brand because there are 
teenagers that have personal brands on Instagram and, and are already making a living. So you can build a personal brand, but it has to be a, a balance. So one part of the balance is occasionally you're you're putting out your personality out there. You can even put out your personality in, in comments on other people's posts, but you're also talking about what you are building. So if you really <clears throat> don't have a product yet, you talk about the learning experience of the product. Anything that you learn that day, say about your product or your service you put out there in a post and it's very specific to what you learned you don't even have to say this is what i learned you can just say here are the three points that you know people need to consider and you because you just learned that <clears throat> and then you might think this is too basic the thing is the the, the internet is you know five billion people and linkedin for example what i'm on is 800 million people Almost everybody has a million people behind them that are not where they are, even if it's very basic. They're like, I'm interested in coding, and someone's posting about the basics of coding. I listen to anybody's information on career coaching or one person business or online business, even if it's basic and I already know it, it's good to be reminded of the basics. So, your people that get it already and are further along than you, they're probably going to see it and be like, Yeah, I, I know that. And then they might post on it and give you some uh, additional advice because a lot of times with people that are building a social media following, they're going to say something, they're going to say something positive and encouraging, and then they're going to give you an extra thing that they would say, I would add this. And that's fine. You want them to see your product. And once they see your product, their network might see your product or whatever you're building. So whatever you're doing, wherever you are, you just have to think about, I'm talking to the person that was just a few months behind me and that's okay. And then after a year, you're talking to a person that was a year behind you and everybody else in between. And so you, the, the, I think the problem is, and, and I've been guilty of this before, but, um, also because i am been in education so long, is we focus on analyzing all the what ifs, pros and cons, right? I go just pros now, what are all the pros? I don't wanna hear the cons because that's just negative feedback for me best way to get feedback loops to improve what you're doing is building in public because people are going to tell you. Um, but if you want to build on LinkedIn, people are pretty positive on that platform. And so in general, you're going to get mostly positive comments and they're going to give you good feedback. And that's going to help build your um, service, your product, and it's going to help build your following. So there's no reason to start. Don't fall into the trap of analysis paralysis it's better just to have an action bias and iterate. Um, so for example, can I tell you a story? So when I was in my twenties, I lived in Japan and I wanted to be a writer. Okay. I write every day now, so it's not gone away, but I wanted to be just a writer. And so I thought I'm just going to be a travel writer. Well, who's going to buy my stuff? No one knows me. And so, you know, I knew famous travel writers, but I wasn't them. They pretty much worked at the New York Times or something before they became a travel writer. So people knew them. So now we have social media. It wasn't like that when I was in China. But the story of Thailand, um, and there's a city there called Chiang Mai, and there are a lot of foreigners that live there, not Thai people. And it was like a hub like 10 years ago, it was like a hub of digital nomads, digital entrepreneurs. But what I thought at that time, with my brain at that time, I thought they are they are blogging. And so I thought, man, I want to be this writer that wrote books. And now are all these, there are all these bloggers doing this. No one's going to read my book. They can just read a blog. And so I just dismissed it and moved on with my life and became a teacher of English. And so now I'm at the same point of, of okay, I'm writing online now. I don't need to dismiss that everybody else can see what everybody else is writing or chat GPT or AI. I don't need to dismiss that they can just write a thousand articles in the time I write one. You don't need to dismiss those things because you are your personal brand and you just need to get eyes on you, which gets eyes on your service or product. So for me, that means posting every day, and then people see what I write and they trust me because I'm authentic. I build authority and I build the following. And then going back to what I said, when I lost a couple of jobs due to budget cuts, if I lose my day job due to a budget cut, I'm not worried. 
even though I have three little kids now, I didn't have any kids then. I'm not worried because I'll just lean into coaching more. I'll lean into resume writing more. I don't go from this income to zero overnight like I did a couple of times. This time I go from this income to, okay, I got this part-time gig. I'm going to just push more into it and decide if I want to just do that for life or if I want to get a job. But it takes away a lot of the fear of job transitions when you have a side gig that has a big enough following to support you and your family. Very interesting points. So Very I think my answer would be, <laughs> yeah, tr- don't, don't, don't think you, <laughs> you have to be perfect. Just start iterating because you'll get much, much better. For example, take someone on YouTube. If they're really good, you're like, okay, yeah, they're really good. Well, go into their page and go back years and see how bad they were at first. They were bad. <laughs> they just had to get better in public. Got it. So. Uh, you touched upon two topics. One was fear of failure and one was confidence. So uh, I understand that we need to get out of this bubble and we need to start uh, taking actions uh, rather than being perfect. But uh, yeah, what is the first step in this direction? Like how does one break out of the shell uh, and yeah, stop uh, fearing about the failure and have confidence in oneself? Mm. Mm. Exposure. So what I mean is the experiences that you've had from childhood until now and what you're being taught in university have given you a set of mindsets and those mindsets produce behaviors and those behaviors are producing outcomes. If you want a new mindset, a new behavior, a new outcome, you have to get, you have to go from that experience to a new experience and that's called exposure. So what I mean is if you want to be a project manager and you're not one now, then you need to be exposed to project managers. For example, local chapters or social media. There's going to be groups of project managers that have thousand plus members in it. You join those groups. You learn from them. You ask them questions in the DMs. You get exposure in your daily life with a project manager that already has that job. Once you get that exposure, then you get a new mindset, a new behavior, a new a new outcome so that new exposure is going to lead to confidence. So you can't just say, okay, I'm going to just get confident. You can't, you have to get a new new exposure, new experience. Then that's going to tell you you, that that means you are taking a courageous step. So a courageous action leads to confidence. You can't just get confidence. It starts with courage, then confidence is produced. So I would say go out there and meet people that are in the field that you want to be in and you take little steps as you learn and watch them, and that'll build your confidence. You can't just build it without doing that. So the first step is having the courage to meet people in the field you want to go into. And then fear, the same thing, because it's going to overcome the fear as you meet other people that are doing what you want to do. And the ideal people to meet are people that are where you are and have now moved over to where you want to be. You can meet them and chat with them online or in person, then they're going to say, yeah, I would felt the same way. But guess what? On this side, uh, it's so much better. And now I realize how much I had to offer, but I didn't when I was on your end. So take courage. You can do it too. And that's this kind of stuff you need to hear. But it needs to be told to you from a person that's kind of already traveled ahead of you. Not too far. You're not like the CEO. They don't remember. <laughs> but someone a, a few steps ahead of you is a perfect person to help you overcome fear and gain confidence. That's a wonderful and insightful answer that you have given. I, I'm very sure most of the audience will find it very helpful. Uh, I think which brings me to the next topic. And uh, the topic is, do you believe that passion should be converted into profession? And in either case, um, how does one find passion, first of all? Mm. So not always. It depends on the person. Some might have a unique passion that might not sell in the market. I don't want them to not do it. I want them to continue to do it. However, thinking about that, there's 5 billion people on the internet. There's probably a niche of people that like whatever you, your interesting, unique passion is. But passions in general, yes, I would follow them. Um, If you have a day job, you can start building your passion project on the side. Um, So what I would say to should you follow your passion to build your profession is yes, but find something they're passionate about 
that looks like work to other people. And then you will be really, really successful. Um, there's the concept of ikigai in Japanese philosophy where you try to find your the thing you love and I think also the market will pay you for. It. But finding something you're passionate about that other people think is work. Like I have a coworker who makes amazing graphics, banners. I don't have the same skills and, or the same passion or say, say it's data crunching. I don't have the same skills or same passion, but she does. I don't. She can have that as her business looks like work to me but for her it's fun so I guess you can save all your passions but I would use a more concrete word and I would say follow where your energy flows so follow your energy if something you do like data analysis gives you energy that you should follow that. It's a signal it's a sign it's an indication that's the direction you should go I am not going to a data analysis I can do it but for more than an hour, I no longer have energy or passion. It did not infuse me with energy. <laughs> so that's a sign it's not my calling for my job. But if you can find something you can do that gives you energy, that's a path. I would do that. And if it looks up, it'll look like work to other people, but to you, it's like, this gives me energy. I'm going to do this. So that's how I say find your passion, follow your energy. Yeah, very interesting. And I'm sure you might have uh, had clients. Uh, who might have told you that, hey, Scott, I want to transition from a career to something else, but I really don't know which career to go into. I am not enjoying what I'm doing right now, but I want to go into something else, but I don't know what that other thing is. And uh, yeah, so you mentioned about energy flow, but what if someone is not able to find that energy flow in anything, so to say? Well, so usually... I would ask them in your current job, what are you really good at about it? Like, is it relationship building? Is it analyzing data? Is it improving processes? It doesn't matter what it is. In that job, what is your strength? What do you enjoy doing? Which is energy. So what do you enjoy? Not about the job. What do you enjoy doing? And then we kind of try to pull out their values. Is it improving processes? Is it running process? And once they find out what they enjoy, then there's like, 10, 20 different career paths that do that same kind of thing that needs that skill. So we're not looking at title. We're looking at skill. What do you enjoy doing? Once you know what you enjoy doing about your current job or you're in your current life, then you can look at all these jobs that, that, that need that skill. And what I usually find is people are afraid, oh, I'm doing that. Yeah. My current, I don't know. I'll be good at that. My next job. I experienced that too. Whatever you were good at in your last job, that value and that energy and that skill, that goes with you wherever you go. That is a part of who you are. That goes with you. If you were good at that in your last job, you're going to be good at that in your next job. It's just a different clientele or a different product or something, but you're going to be good at it because that's that's a part of you that you bring with you. So that, that's how I would approach that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I was going through your LinkedIn profile and I saw in your about section and also in uh, the recommendations, the people have written uh, that you help them uh, writing their CVs, their cover letters and so on. So let's assume someone is out there in the market looking for a job. Uh, can you tell me a step-by-step, -step, a structured approach of transitioning from job A to job B or um, let's say starting or finding a new job in itself. So what are the steps that one should follow? Mm. So concerning the CV, depends on how much time you have. So one thing I highly recommend is having a social media presence, finding people in the job that you want to go into or in the company that you want to go to and seeing if, if you can get them to answer a question or two on their, in their DMs. Or if even better, if they will have a coffee chat with you via video. Once you do that, that increases feedback loops. So what I mean by that is you're going to hear nuances about how they talk about the field, how they talk about their company. And you're going to learn how to tweak your resume based on that feedback. And it's also like miniature informal interviews. You're going to get better at talking about the, the, the industry because you've been talking to them. And then when you get into the interview, you're going to be better at, at doing that. So there's lots of... of good feedback, good potential for talking to people uh, that are already where you are. 
then using that information to tweak your resume. So of course, or your CV, there's always is um, websites out there that can say, okay, here's the job description, jobscan.co is one of them, and here's the resume, how much of it matches? Okay, that's good. That's that's data, that's information, but you still have to make it flow. You still have to get the story into your resume. So the way I do that is, there, of course, uh, in the U.S., there's a professional summary profile uh, at the very top of a resume. I wouldn't make that too long. Get straight to the point because recruiters are moving fast. So I usually to do like two lines, maybe three sentences. After that, two very important sections. One is like the skills or core competencies section. And the other is one that is for transitioners specifically. So then you get into your work history. Work history is secondary, education, secondary. The top half of your CV is most important. So the core competencies do need to match with what's on the job description. If you got those skills, that goes on your resume. If you don't, go learn them quickly, even if it's a basic level knowledge. Everything's available to learn online. Um, and then the next section is really important. So if you want to go into learning and development or, or project management, I would put a section that is just project management experience. So this is above your work experience. So this is for a person that's never had the title of project manager. If you put project manager experience, then you put, that's your heading. And then you put three uh, bullet points of projects that you've been involved in. Okay. And preferably if you have metrics, that would be great. But the key is that top half of your security is all about the job that you want to go into, not where you've come from. It doesn't matter where you've come from. You need to show, this is what I want to do. These are my skills. These are some examples of my skills. That's what I want you to see first. Then go look at my work history that doesn't have anything to do with that particular industry. <laughs> um, so that would be what I would say is highlight those things that only matter to your next job. I totally agree with that. And yeah, great points again. So uh, that brings me to a next question. So you mentioned about connecting with people on LinkedIn or other social media sites. Uh, so what is the right way to connect and how do you initiate the conversation? What do you tell the other person? Yeah, so if you're looking at a particular industry, say it's instructional designer, um, then I would go find the biggest instructional designer on your platform. They have the most following. Find that influencer. And then you might not want to speak to that influencer, but you could. But what I would say is look at their following and start making connections with all the instructional designers that are following him or her. Um, then comment and comment on people's posts that are talking about or are in that field. And then once you do that for a week or so, then you can DM them. So the idea is when you DM somebody, that doesn't need to be the first time they've seen your name or your face. You need to be familiar. And once you're familiar, they're like, oh, this person is a part of my tribe. And then you and then you tell them hello, tell them what you're interested in, maybe make a comment about a post that really spoke to you, and that's it. The end. Then see if they reply. If they reply, then continue the conversation like a normal, authentic human. And then if you have questions about their field, uh, then you ask, but you never go straight in and be like, hi, I'm see your uh, industrial uh, in instructional designer. Could you give me a, a re reference to this company that you work for? No, no one's going to do that. You have to build relationships. Um, so that, that's how you do it. You, I think people are very nervous about DMs initially, but if you've commented on their post and they're familiar with you based on your name and profile picture, then all you got to do really is Tell them who you are and give them a, a compliment about their content. I'm assuming that you're honest about that you do like their content or you wouldn't be following them. Okay. People, people love that and respond to that. Don't sell them anything. And don't, add, don't, don't go straight in for an ask. And you may never get an ask. Like a lot of people talk about getting referrals. They're the biggest thing. They, they are the biggest thing. But a lot of times they happen like within companies. I'm going to refer my friend um, or I'm going to refer someone to another job in a company. Don't expect that you're going to get referrals from people on LinkedIn or Twitter. 
um, just because you've messaged them. Don't, that's not your, that's not your goal. If it happens, awesome. But people are kind of, you know, they're aware and they're only going to refer people that they really think will do a good job because their reputation's on the line too. So the referral is not the end goal for me. The end goal for me is, is insight. You get insight. It helps everything. It helps you grow. It helps your resume get tweaked. It helps you in interviews. You're looking for insight more than anything. And people are usually more than willing to give insight because they're like, I feel wise. I feel helpful because I'm giving insight to this person who's messaging me. And then you win and they win. Makes, makes total sense. And I completely agree with that. Uh, one problem that a lot of people who are either transitioning or are finding a new job uh, usually have is that they don't have sufficient time or they find time management to be very difficult. So what is your advice? How should their day look like ideally? And what activities are like must have activities in their daily routines? Hmm. So all depends on, on what they have going on in life. So if they're a student uh, and they're not working and they have time management problems, it may be because they have too much time on them. So too much time can sometimes be hard to get a hold of because you just don't know what to do next with your time. So you, you sleep or you play video games or whatever. Um, now with, um, a, with people that are in their career, then they come home and they're worn out and want to do any more um, and then people with kids you have a lot of responsibilities to take care of them put them to bed so I am I'm currently finishing up my dissertation in a PhD program so here's my story when I had my first child I had a, a opportunity to go to a in-person PhD residency program and I thought I can't do that. I have a kid. <laughs> this changes everything. I can't do that. When I had my third child in the span of my wife had my third child in the span of five years, uh, she was two months old, my third child, when I started the PhD program. So my mindset went from, I have one child. I can't do this. Do I have three child children? Now I can do this. That doesn't make any logical sense. The difference was I'm going to make it happen because there's nothing that can stop me and I know how to live my day-to-day -day life now. I know how to take care of children in my case and I'm going to do it. Um, it's going to be a hybrid program. It's not going to be in person. You know, you have to kind of pick your programs that fit your lifestyle. So for me now, for example, I have three kids, full-time job, what else? Dissertation to write and yeah, LinkedIn business and other stuff. So I have, have a website blocker and my LinkedIn plus some other websites, it's set for one hour a day. After one hour, it shuts it down. I can't be on it anymore. Yeah, I can't. Won't, won't let me. <laughs> so that parameter of setting one hour to do this particular thing makes me super efficient. Yeah, maybe I'm a little bit like tense sometimes, but after that one hour, it's like it's all all gone. Uh, I don't have to worry about that anymore and i have a dissertation to write i find one to two hours a day to do that it's time blocked so there's a parameter on it and then once that two hours is up i'm done now i have kids and work the other 10 11 hours of the day when i'm awake now i do sleep a little bit less than most people <laughs> but i think you have to time block and set parameters on your time because it'll be more efficient so have you ever heard of the um let's see Pomo, not Pomodoro, that's that's time blocking and speed. But there's another one called Parkinson's Law or Parkinson's Principle. So that one says, however much time you give to do something, that's how much time it will take. So if you give yourself to the end of the week to do it, you'll be done right at the very end of the week. If you give yourself to the end of the day to do it, you're going to have to get it done that day if you're serious. So for me, that's like with LinkedIn, one hour, with dissertation, two hours. That's all I give myself time to do it. Therefore, I get much more efficient because I get a lot more done. So if I didn't have that, I'd probably spend more time on it. Now, I don't think you should block all of your life and days into time parameters because you'd be just working so hard. But for me, that's two, three hours of my day is, is time blocked. And because of that, it makes me efficient. So I would say whatever you are, 
in, wherever you are in life, if you can say, okay, I have one hour a day where I'm going to do this thing. After that, I can't do it anymore. And I have a, a timer set or whatever, or an accountability partner. You're going to get a ton done in that one hour that would have taken you multiple hours thinking about getting started, thinking about what I should do next and how, when I should quit. Mm, no, not for me, because that, that means the rest of my day is free to be relaxed and do other things. But as far as work, as far as job, like on the side job, you have to set time parameters so that you can get more done, not less. Yeah, very actionable tip again. So I, I see that you speak a lot about conflict resolution and you have studied about that as well. So tell us some more about that. And uh, yeah, how does one manage conflict in the workplace? Is the common interview question. So I would like to know practical insights. From you. <laughs> so conflict resolution was a subject I studied in graduate school about communication. And then it comes up with careers and it comes up even in my dissertation. Um, so as far as conflict, what I've come to understand is you have to understand what the other person's conflict style is because you're not going to win a conflict by just doing it your way. You need to understand the other person. So that takes empathy, that takes understanding, that takes time with them. And then ideally, you don't want to just have a win-lose scenario. You want to have a win-win scenario where here's a win-lose, you're going to get to one resolution. You want to be on the winning side, not the losing side. But if you can do a win-win because you understand the other person's needs and their style of conflict, then you can actually create some third approach that would be an answer that is better than the two of you separate it, separate and then that's when it's like, oh, wow, that's insight. That's collaboration. Um, and hey, it's the same same way with love. Okay. So let's say, have you ever heard of the love languages in relationships? So some people might want quality time. Some people might want like gifts. Some people might want physical touch. Different way that they uh, want love. Okay. But a lot of people in relationships think that I need to meet the person, the spouse, the girlfriend of her, who is um, just like me or um, they have the same love language as me and we're just right for each other. That's not been my experience. My experience is if I uh, want to be in a relationship with this person, want to love this person, I need to understand how they want to be loved, not how I choose to show love because that's not how they want to be loved. If I understand them, then I, I can... Um, I can show, they can feel loved. And so, for example, my wife's uh, love language would be quality time. But for me, that's not my love language, but I have to do that for her because that's hers and that shows her love. I know this is a strange example, not maybe not what you're planning for me to get into, but it's the same thing with conflict and a person that's on your team. You have to understand them. How do they feel respected? How do they feel like you are appreciating their dignity if it's a real serious conflict? Not just respect them as a um, their job, but ex respect the dignity of their personhood, their humanity. Then you try to understand them from their perspective. If they sense that that is your aim, it's hard to be mad at the other person. It's hard to have conflict that's too serious. It's more turns into collaboration. Yeah. Again, a wonderful uh, and actionable one, like creating win-win scenarios. So I'm going towards the end of our session. And uh, yeah, before we close, I would like to know from you, what is creative thinking and critical thinking? And I've seen that you teach these subjects. Um, and yeah, how does one develop these skills? So critical thinking, I'll start there. Critical thinking means you have to move beyond the assumptions that you already have. Your assumptions, kind of like we said earlier with experiences, that mindset is developed, that assumptions are there and they're there for your survival. Maybe some they're there for their own survival. They want to, uh, that mindset wants to exist and it wants to keep going because that's the parameters you gave it, sort of vector parameters. 
But once you overcome the assumption, you realize there are other possibilities, then you can think in new ways. So for example, if you have an assumption about how something should be done, uh, uh, or, you, you know, old assumption, things should be done uh, in person and not online. Well, when you get online, you test that assumption. Can I do this online? And then it comes back true. Well, then your assumption that you had before is a little cracked. You keep testing it, just like a scientist. Test the hypothesis that actually my assumption is wrong. So if you list your assumptions, you list what you believe, and then you test those with an actual experience of doing something just for the sake of experimental testing, then your brain and your assumptions, your mindset are like, whoa, there's a whole new world out there. Now I'm thinking like different people. I'm around different people. Um, so I think of Steve Jobs, like the top was off of the lid. Assumptions. He was way above everybody else in his time about what was possible. Okay. He didn't believe anything wasn't really possible. Um, so to get there for most of us, most normal humans, you just have to test out your assumptions and prove them false so that you can get to where you want to go because you're not getting to where you want to go with your usual assumptions. Otherwise you'd be there already. And the creative thinking piece is back to the Steve Jobs example. What is out there that hasn't been done in a new way, in a, in a way that resembles, I would say, art, not just science. So science is like the critical thinking piece. We test hypothesis and things. But with creative thinking, it's like art. It's like dance. It's like romance. It's like love. Um, what is a new combination of ideas that, ha that hasn't been proposed out there? Now, I would also bring this back to brand with creative thinking. You are a niche of one just by being who you are. So the way you do things, the way you think, and what you comp, com what your content looks like, is unique to you. And that's using your creative thinking to think what is unique to me. So what I would do there is list your skills, list your interests, overlay those, and see what interesting intersections there are, and be creative with it. And then you'll pr produce something that is unique. And even if there are like 10 other people that you know of on social media that do your thing, they don't have your personality or your character. So you have something to offer. Start there. And then back to the beginning, iterate until you see a, a unique need among your clients that you can feel that no one else is feeling. But you might not know that at first. Um, People are often wondering, what is my niche? That's a creative venture to figure out. You usually can't figure that out just by sitting down and thinking. Your niche may be, instead of emerge, it probably is developed over about, could be over a year of, of posting, but you have to stay open. You can't stay so focused on one topic, I would say have multiple topics. And one day the intersection of those topics will coalesce and you'll have your, your niche of one that was creatively produced over a long period of building in public. I love how you dissected and presented these things and very actionable ones. And I'm very sure that you read a lot of different things, books, blogs, etc. So what are your top three recommendations for our viewers? For books and blogs and reading? Yes. So on the, I'm more of a nonfiction person. <laughs> so on the nonfiction side, there's a really good book that blew the top off of my assumptions, which is called Immunity to Change. Um, there's also videos about immunity to change online. Um, a lot of people don't seem to know about it, maybe some in the coaching field. But immunity to change is a really good one because it tells you, it gives you a very specific roadmap uh, to test your assumptions and prove them false so that you can create different outcomes. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Um, so that's on the nonfiction, pretty neurotypical 
practical side uh, of, of behavior change or belief that I can do a particular entrepreneurial journey. That's a really good book. Um, video wise, I mostly listen to, to videos and uh, audio books. Um, but I would say one of my favorites right now is Dan Ko, D-A-N-K-O-E. He speaks a lot about the one person business model. He speaks about growing your social media, but he overlays that. This is this niche of one. He overlays that very common topic with a um, umbrella uh, uh, under the umbrella of philosophy, primarily philosophy, spirituality, psychology, but under philosophy, um, how we're um, self-actualizing, how we're self-transcending. So that's a really good one because I like uh, content that is a a bit uh, philosophical or existential so that I realize life is not just cause and effect. There's more to life. And when you realize that there is more to life, the things that you're doing in life, that you're trying to create something, it, it, it feels uh, not less serious, but if something goes wrong, it's okay. This is all me testing this idea now I'm going to test another idea now I'm going to test another idea um and that's okay because I'm growing as a person I'm growing in my identity um I got a little further down the line I'm, I'm entering into the world of the unknown and I just keep going that direction because I believe that what I have in me the world needs once and when I get to there you know then that's that's the really good spot to be because then you're doing what you love and what looks like work to the world so those are my those are my two interesting yeah which brings me to the trademark question of this podcast since it is named uh, the career excellence podcast breakthrough with Sudarsh I would like to know what does the word breakthrough mean to you? And if you can share very quickly one breakthrough uh, that stood out in your life. In my life. So breakthrough to me looks like overcoming assumptions. So in my life, the very first probably breakthrough I had was after high school. Um, I, I live in the central part of the United States, but my friend told me that he was going to California to work with his um, grandfather. And so he asked me to come with him. So I, I had a vehicle. So I said, yes. And so we drove to California. And in my area of the country at that time, everyone looked and talked and acted like me. There wasn't a lot of diversity. But when I was in California, I was just like, whoa, it's very, very diverse. And I've never been around such diversity before. And I really, really loved it. Like, it was awesome to me. I don't know why, but I was just like, it, it made me very happy. And so then that just took me down years of different experiences where I traveled abroad, where I studied international subjects, where I studied intercultural communication and diversity. Um but it all took getting different exposure. And I'm so glad I did that. I think I would still be a good person without having done that or try to be a good person. But that experience of going and living somewhere else and seeing a different culture has taken me all around the world. And uh, that's invaluable. So I guess my answer is travel, but it doesn't always have to be travel. Sometimes it just has to be knowing someone getting in a relationship with someone that is not does not have a similar background to you so that you can see from different perspectives and understand people more intimately wow i think uh this this time frame is not sufficient to understand the wealth of knowledge and expertise that you have uh but before you leave i would like to ask you this very last question what is your final advice for our viewers I'll tell you the same advice I give my six-year-old son. <laughs> so that is in his, you know, words that under, you know, are understandable to him. That is, build, don't destroy. 
So he gets Legos and he wants to just knock them down. <laughs> uh, there's a there's a time for that and a job for that, but uh, tell him to build, not destroy. And now he's always building, always building something new with his Legos. Same thing for us as adults. Just build, don't destroy. Build, 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 whatever it is. And preferably build in, in public so that you get feedback. Build as possible. Because the more feedback you get, the faster you're going to move forward in life. So my answer would be to start building. Awesome. So I'm very sure our audience is going to love this podcast. And for our audience, if you really love this, if you enjoyed this, please do consider uh, liking this, commenting, and uh, sharing it across with your friends and family. And do let us know your uh, questions uh, for Scott in the comments and also what you would like to hear from him uh, in the next series of podcasts that we make with him because I would really, really love to have you back, uh, Scott, on the podcast. So uh, that is Sudarsh uh, signing off from the Career Excellence Podcast Breakthrough with Sudarsh. Take care. Bye. Thank you.